Hi, I'm Rick Anthony, and welcome to the Someone You Should Know podcast, the podcast that focuses on musicians, authors, and interesting people. We like to say we're making a difference one artist at a time. So sit back, have a cold one, and get ready to meet someone you should know. Today's podcast guest is an author who immigrated from Moscow when she was a child, and she's a very creative lady with a children's book called The Girl with Pink Hair. That's what's in store for today. Will you please welcome from Massachusetts, Diana Caprina. Diana, welcome aboard. Oh, hi. Thank you. Diana, can you take us back to the process of coming to America? Were you excited, scared, hopeful? I know that was a long time ago, but uh, what do you remember about coming to America? I like that you asked that question. That is actually the beginning of my memoir. And I start at that point. I was nine years old when I immigrated. And I remember just being really hopeful because I was leaving so much behind. Um, I was born in Georgia. So Belize, Georgia was the, Georgia was the Republic mm-hmm. of, uh, Georgia was the Republic of the Soviet Union. Yeah, I don't know what you're thinking. But well, she doesn't sound like she's from Atlanta. <laughs> I've gotten that a, a different, lot. A different yeah. Georgia, yeah, absolutely. Maybe she's from Dolphin, Georgia. I don't know. It doesn't sound like... <laughs> Continue. I'm sorry, darling. I wrote, um, I wrote comedy for 19 years, too, so... Uh, yeah. No, I love that one because I, I've gotten it a lot. I've gotten so many... Well, you don't sound like you're from Georgia. And then I usually used to respond that... Well, I worked on my accent, and back then I was naive in my response. I didn't realize, and they would take, and I would go with it. And I'm from northern just... Georgia, much northern Georgia. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Okay, you you, uh, you were born in Georgia, and then... Uh... Yeah, and uh, I, we lived quite differently than how people live here today, wow. or how societies even today. Um, we had a small apartment, and in it lived my great-grandmother, my grandmother, my grandfather, my mother, and me. And it wasn't a spacious three-bedroom. It was actually, I, as I would uh, describe it today, a one-bedroom, if that. Wow. Yeah. Um, Think of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or the Willy Wonka, yeah, where, where everybody's in the same bed, you know? Everybody's <laughs> jumped in, except uh, my grandparents were actually really mobile, mm-hmm. so they weren't always featured in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting that visual as far as everybody in the same apartment. Yeah, that's going to be a little challenging. Yeah, and that's what I grew up with, and the whole community it was that we lived in, it was just a community. Everybody, mm-hmm. all the neighbors knew each other. Everybody knew their business. It was almost like a little village. The mm-hmm. kids ran around. I had friends. That's what I knew. Uh-huh. Um, then war came to Georgia um, and it was happening. Mm-hmm. Everything was falling apart. So I moved to Armenia okay. um, and I lived there for two years with my mother. And that was already such a big cultural change because again even though these are republics of the soviet union they're completely different countries with completely different languages nothing about them is the same but somehow they all uh, end up speaking russian at one point Mm -hmm. Um, and that was what connected everybody that we all spoke russian and everybody served to the greater purpose of the soviet union um but it's, it was a big enough transition for me as a child. So when the perspective came that I'm coming to the U.S., I had to be hopeful because I was getting turned away from so much love to come to uh, live a country in a country I didn't know, a language I was trying to learn. I didn't know it. Mm-hmm. Um, to live with my dad, who I hadn't seen in years and this is not because he abandoned us but it's because he was just working and trying um to achieve the best from mm-hmm. my mother and i so we could come join him right right now is uh, you're in uh, massachusetts now was that where you migrated to or would you migrate to where he was at yale university oh, yale, so he was okay. working up for, at his, on his master's at, at yale university and that's when we came so i first landed in new haven um, and that was the beginning, I, uh, the beginning of it all. It was all completely different from what I imagined. It wasn't very much like the 
Cinderella and the, all the Disney stories I watched or was able to watch. I love The Little Mermaid. Again, very different from The Little Mermaid in reality. Um, <laughs> but I had those hopes. I was like, I'm like the little, I'm traveling and I'm coming to this unknown place and they have these cool, so I had to be hopeful. But it was extremely hard um, and just the culture. And I just tried to immerse myself as much as I could in it. Did you see at, at at an early age, I'm not sure if you have that memory right now, but did you see that kids at your, your age didn't really get how lucky they were to be as free as they were in America versus uh, you know, any constraints that you might have had living in? It's the not that years? they didn't even get it. It's more that I had to completely forget that portion of me to fit in. Mm-hmm. It's, Nobody got it. Nobody still gets it. Mm -hmm. Um, I've lost friends along the way just because it just gets exhausting because I'm not your pity story. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a voice. I'm not here to entertain or any of that. You Mm -hmm. know, Um, I have my own life and this is how I choose to live it. And no, I don't want to get married for, to speed up the green card process. No, that is not the solution. And I'm, I've gotten tired of having those conversations. Yeah, I can understand that. I can understand that. Now, at what point did you realize that you were a, uh, a creative writer? You had the capabilities of writing children. Always. Um, oh, really? Okay. I love to write. So when I was very little, I learned to read very early on. Um, and I, lo- I read Pushkin and, and I read in Russian. Obviously, this uh-huh. is the first language I learned. Um and poetry was the first really exposure. My father was a big fan of poetry. It was something um, he installed instilled in me from a young age, had me memorize it. And again, the Soviet Union is just an authoritarian culture. And how the schooling went, it was very intense. So by second grade, kids were writing, um, reciting poems by heart. And I don't mean short little poems. They were reciting Pushkin poems and they were deep in dialect of the why this poem. And it was just very intense schooling. I would say it's the intensity of what people today send their kids to private school for, where they spend $60,000, $80,000 a year. Mm -hmm. That is the intensity of it. And that's what I had. Mm -hmm. So then I came here and it was all very, very confusing. Um, (laughs) very (laughs) mumbled jumbled. I got, uh, my parents wanted better, better schooling for me. Uh So instead of sending me to a public school in New Haven, they sent me to a Catholic school. So Mm -hmm. that's even more confusing. (laughs) I was raised Catholic. So I know what you mean with the nuns and everything like that. (laughs) And my first experience was Catholic school, and I still remember raising my hand. I have this vivid memory of just raising my hand because I really had to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to say, may I go to the bathroom in English at this point. This is my first exposure. I'm ready for school. Mm-hmm. I arrived July 30th, 1993. I had, what, a couple of months to prepare before school started, and boom. Never learned how to say, may I go to the bathroom? Didn't think it was necessary. <laughs> just just for the record, I have uh, injuries here from nuns, uh, from rulers. But I raised my hand, and they called on me, and I stood up, and I mm. said it in Russian. And they, their mouth dropped, and they didn't know what to do with me. Luckily, there was uh, another Russian-speaking girl mm-hmm. who happened to be our family friend, because, again... Not so many Russians in New Haven yeah, right, um, yeah. with their kids <laughs> in private school. So she comes in, she just looks at me like, hey, like, she says it in Russian. She said, Что тебе надо? I'm like, Я хочу писать. And she's like, no. Oh. She looks at the nun, she goes, She just wants to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I had this like terrifying scar because I, as a child, I'm thinking I'm going to pee my pants. I'm going to pee my pants. Come on, someone rescue me right now because it's just it's, I'm just going to pee in front of like this whole school on my first day in this uniform, mm-hmm. school with nuns. I've never even seen nuns before. Mm-hmm. In the Soviet Union, religion was 
banished. It, religion wasn't, mm -hmm. it was evil. No, we didn't have, Christmas tree was put up on New Year's, like New Year's became celebrated. New Year's was the celebration with Santa mm -hmm. Claus. Not Christmas. Christmas mm -hmm. was... Yeah, not, so, not, not, not acknowledged. Yeah. Uh, quick question for you. Your dad was at Yale working on his master's. What did he get his master's in? In what uh, what field? Conflict negotiation, international conflict negotiation. Oh, that's 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 deep. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> quite a genius, as some say. So. All right. Very good. Um, no. And that's why actually we ended up in um I live in Belmont, but we ended up in, um, in the Cambridge area just because of that, because um, next step after that, he went to work um, under Roger Fisher. So for those that know conflict or know resolution and know business mm -hmm. and negotiation, they they will know automatically who Roger Fisher is. Uh, for those who don't, Roger Fisher was the founding father of the Harvard negotiation school that exists today. So everything we that every everything that's everyone everyone is taught today was mm -hmm. he was the founding father. Uh, for anyone who to simplify it even more, for anyone who watched Julia, the HBO show of Julia Child. Uh, oh TV. yeah, I love Julia Child. Yes. Okay, so there's one little seg segment where they actually bring up Roger Fisher because oh, really? I have to yes, check out because again. the guy. Um, that he didn't want to produce Julia Child. She was begging him to produce her, and he said, "No, I don't. I like. I don't want to produce you." And he brings in this dude who's just this nerdy man who's like, "Yes, I'm about positive, getting to yes." I wrote a book, getting to yes, and th it was Roger Fisher, and it was just, just funny because I knew him as a child, and just uh, seeing the actor on screen, I was like, "How did they come up with that's what Roger Fisher looks like?" That was my only like. <laughs> Because I, yeah, I knew him as a child. I've gone to his Christmas party, so it was a little astonishing to do. That's what they got from that? I don't uh -huh. know. Now, your book is called The Girl with Pink Hair. The title itself is intriguing. What significance does the pink hair hold to the story, and how does it reflect like the character's journey? Um, well, to the story, absolutely none. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, uh, here, here was my creative uh, thinking here. Um, I wanted to make the character completely distinguished, like distinguished with something that makes them okay. different. Uh, but something that makes them different, not that, that can be immediately seen as a disability or something very harsh like that. It's just, okay, she was born with pink hair. How weird and cool is that at the same point? But that's not really... Uh, what makes her who she is, or it has anything to do with anything. In reality, it's really her voice. And I really wanted to make that contrast seen in the book. Right. And felt. Oh, very good, very good. All right, now, the book follows the adventures of Paulina, and your daughter's name is also Paulina. Did yes. you write it through her eyes, or what input uh, does she I provide to the to. story? I thought I was writing it through her eyes to come mm. to realize I was writing it through my eyes as a child oh, okay. um, because her voice has never been diminished. She mm -hmm. has always had a very loud uh, voice. I've always tried to not even tell her be quiet or use your indoor voice. We, we've we gone through variations mm -hmm. of it all, and I've always given her choices and never told her that in any way that she just needs to be quiet and sit in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, but as I was writing the book, I was thinking about that and thinking how I am parenting her. And this is maybe to be a teaching lesson for all those parents, because I know the alternative and that's where I grew up again, the authoritarian. And this is what I mean by authoritarian. Mm -hmm. His children were taught in one way. It was extremely structured uh, and it didn't, meet my needs because to this day I don't draw although I'm a visual learner and that would be something really fun to do mm -hmm. but I have this memory of when I was seven years old and I had a homework assignment to draw a picture of a beach and I, I knew I couldn't do it so mm -hmm. I went to my mom and my mom has been uh, took art classes previously 
uh, because again, creative creativity was very in, enforced in the Soviet Union. So oh. what people know today as costs a lot of money. So ballet, uh, gymnastics, ice skating, uh, writing, art, piano, mm -hmm. all of that was the foremost of importance in the so that was so the uh, creativity uh, or the learning the arts was definitely it was, embraced. It, was, it was paid by the government because yeah. again we uh the soviets were uh at war it was a cold war and they really wanted to be seen as the winners of the olympics like there was such a push to be the top the best mm -hmm. and so it was all sponsored through governments, um, everything. As a child, I played piano, and I went to an art school, um, a music school, mm -hmm. to play piano. I got accepted. Um, and they had really weird ways of how they accepted people. <laughs> I can imagine. It was solely I... based on talent and possible potential. Um, but going back to that art, my mom was admitted to art school and she knew how to draw. Okay. So long story short, I went to her and yes, I cheated. And so she drew for me and I brought the picture in and I, I submitted and the teacher looked at me and she said, you couldn't have possibly drew this. And I was like, no, I did it. And she's like, okay, sit down and draw it again. So of uh, course I tried busted. to make the picture. <laughs> Oh, my arm hurts today. I, I worked so hard on it. Again, and then I kept using my left hand to do so. Uh -huh. And she, every time I touched my left, would use my left hand, she would come up with a ruler to smack it. Yep. Um, because using your left hand was wrong. Like you were not supposed to use your mm. left hand. That was not the right way to do things. There was one way to do it, and that's what that's how you did it through that structure. Yeah. That's, that's so it was wrong. very much like that song. Uh, who was it? Was it Pink Floyd? My memory with. My dyslexic mind sometimes gets up. Another brick in the wall? <laughs> yes, there you go. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, Pink Floyd for sure. So yeah. the video of it, that's that's exactly what everyone, the people were trying to go against that estab establishment and just wow. being so restricted and the children were really restricted. So it was um, different coming here and just even learning all that. And I completely drained off topic of what the, uh, the question was. Jeez, no. I don't know if I covered it. Now, the pink air, as Paulina will find out, is actually a reminder set for her by the Queen of the Unicorns. You're going to have to unpack this for us a little bit here. <laughs> I re-edited all the fun version, uh, second version will come in, and I do like this portion too, but I, I simplify it in the next book. Um, oh, okay. there's, so there's going to be another book. Okay, great. We'll get to that a little bit later. I'm working with a brilliant illustrator. I switched illustrators. Um this book, actually, the illustrator is from Yerevan, Armenia, the one that's available now. I found him through Facebook. We connected, and um, I just wanted to use display his talent, and so that's how it came. We, had, we still had language barriers because I don't speak, speak Armenian, mm -hmm. and Armenia today is its own country. Right. Nobody's forced to speak Russian. <laughs> and he he didn't really speak Russian. He knew some. And so there was just so much conflict um, with how the characters came out. But again, it's it, from an artistic point of view, it's just a very wonderful work. Uh, with that said, uh, the unicorn. Uh -huh. I wanted to tie in the pink hair to something. Uh -huh. But because we tend to be so forgetful, I tend to be very forgetful. My daughters tend to forgetful. So I tried to tie it in with, well, you have the pink hair. So every time you look in the mirror, you can remind yourself, well, I can sing my problems away rather than um, whine, cry, or... Right, yes, yes, yes. Um, I don't know how well that actually works in reality. Uh, my daughter sometimes still whines at me a lot. I, I want to... <laughs> through the battle of it for the past couple of days because she decided she wanted to learn to crochet. Okay. <laughs> I've never crocheted. Mm -hmm. I learned how to knit. So I used to, as a child, always sit uh, by my great grandmother and I would just, I loved watching her knit and she would knit wool socks and everything else. And that's what we wore to mm -hmm. stay warm. Um, clothes was very, 
hard to buy or purchase or have for good quality. It was easier to make everything yourself. Um, ironically, it's a very expensive hobby in the U.S. Here, arts and crafts and making and knitting. Yes, and- yes, yes. I know my wife wanted some for Christmas, oh, and uh, I was I'm going. What the heck? Fifty dollars on yarn. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, no, 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 speaking of, speaking of the cover art, this book's cover art is quite striking. Who did the illustration on this book? Um, the book that is out in publishing, right? The one that's out right, right now. The one with the, um, uh, the adventure of the girl with pink hair, yeah. On Armenia, mm-hmm. I'm in, um, I can't, I, I forgot his name. I need to see it in front of me, but I want to say it's Graham Marian. Um, again, not a great Armenian speaker, I am anymore. <laughs> That's fine. You know, what's really funny is uh, I happen to have a guest, a former countryman of yours. They were talking about all the struggles they had. He was from Moscow and his band is called Leonette and Friends. And I found out about them because one of my wife and my songs is called Just You and Me by Chicago. And I happened to see the video of this band called Leonette and Friends. And I reached out to them. They were a former guest on the show. And we went and saw them in concert. They sing perfect English, but don't speak regular English as far as that goes. But they were telling me about the struggles. Uh, He was telling me that they didn't have any of the sheet music, any of the tablature to do these songs. So he did it all completely by ear. He's that good of a musician. And he said that growing up, they did not have the pickups for guitars. What they were doing is they were stealing pieces out of phone boxes uh, of public phones to get these specific resistors and these uh, microphones and stuff like that that are associated with the phones and such like that. So he was talking about all the struggles of growing up in the Soviet Union or in Moscow back in the back in the days long before communism fell. And a lot of scarcity, uh, scarcity. I'm sorry for I invaded my daughter's room, and it's her iPad ringing. I don't know. <laughs> Mom, what are you doing in my room? <laughs> hope she doesn't know about it. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, there was a lot of scarcity. I mean, everything that people have today, people didn't have. Yeah, your, Now, your daughter is the same age as you were when you came to the States. Do you ever sit down and talk to her about how hard you had it coming here and how easy she has it? Not yet. She's okay. a little too sensitive for that. Okay. Wait till she's a teen. That's a good time yeah, to get her. That's, that's a great time. I mean, yeah. But she's a little too sensitive. So anything I've ever even said, like, uh, the struggle today really for us is because I am stateless. So mm-hmm. the big portion of that is, mommy, why can't we, you know, go to Italy with grandma and grandpa? Or why can't you fly and go visit Um Lucy, who is my sister, and she's um, an investigative journalist in Armenia. Oh, okay. Um, so I can't hop on the plane. I can't even hop on the plane right now to um, go to Miami to oh, work. Yeah, that's that's got to be rough. Yeah, uh, which which is very limiting, and for her, it's really hard to grasp. And she says, "Well, why can't you just go get your passport? Like, stop being lazy. Just go do it." <laughs> I tried to explain to her, she's like, well, how does that work? And then everyone around her obviously is is not like that. So she has a hard time just even understanding that concept. And I feel like until all the pieces are resolved, um, I don't want to have those conversations with her just yet. Right. It's, it's very much like the movie The Terminal with Tom Hanks. His country yeah. no, is no longer exists, so he is basically in limbo and can't go anywhere. So you're basically... You're Tom Hanks in that movie. Do you realize that? Yes, I am. I've always realized that. Um, and I was always amazed when I even told people that. And they didn't, never even made that correlation. So I'm like... Hey, I, I, I immediately man, thought of that. Really yeah, have to be stuck in the airport. <laughs> and I could be. I could purchase a ticket right now trying to fly to Miami with uh-huh. my daughter. And I could come in and I would give them my ID that's expired, uh-huh. my state ID. And they say... That's wrong ID, and they would call further services to establish, and they would find out that who I am and that I have no no country. I don't know if that would affect my domestic flying abilities. Would they allow me on the yeah. plane? Yeah. I, I have no idea. 
<laughs> something you might want to investigate and if you want to go to Disney or something like that. <laughs> oh, just I, I drive. That just drive. I'm like, not even going to try. <laughs> now, before we continue, I want to say thanks so much for tuning into the Someone You Should Know podcast. You can find us on the web at someoneyoushouldknowpodcast.com. There you're going to find our recent news, our archive of past episodes, and a whole lot more. If you happen to be visiting for the very first time, we say thank you so much for, for doing so, and leave us a review. We really and truly do appreciate it. According to Buzzsprout, the service that shares our podcast, all the streaming platforms, we are so very, very blessed. I want to say thank you so very much for checking out the podcast. Since we hit the the podcast circuit in October of 2022, we have reached over 2,000 cities worldwide in 85 countries. I want to salute a couple. Uh, Brandon with Amherst, Massachusetts, Defiance, Missouri, Oyster Bay, Long Island, and Omsk and Moscow and uh, the Russian Federation. The Someone You Should Know podcast heard wherever quality streaming audio is available. We're speaking with Diana Caperna, an author who has a great book called Adventures of the Girl with Pink Hair. Now, Diana, when I was in broadcasting school, they told us to pronounce it Moscow, not Moscow. What do you, how do you pronounce it? Is it Moscow to you or is it Moscow to you? Uh, Well, in Russian, it's Moskva. Moskva? Okay. Well, talking about (laughs) your your growing, growing up in English, would you say Moscow then or Moscow? It, I think it really depends on the state you live in. Yeah, especially Georgia, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Moscow. Yes. And then in Boston, everything is Boston. Boston, Moscow, Boston yeah. yeah. Harvard. And I tried doing the Boston accent, but it turned, I, I started sounding a little too nasal then. I, I'm uh-huh. trying to revert back to my old school teachings. <laughs> you're, old. You're, 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 you're fun to talk to. This is this is. Fun. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. I, I gotta am. ask you, how long did it take for you to write this book? Oh, uh, I, uh, it was in my head. And I just had to somehow get it out. Uh-huh. Um, I think in my head before I type, because typing for me is almost, it is like playing the piano. Okay. I stop playing the piano, but I type. And I type really, really fast. And I just, whatever I see, I pour it on the page. Mm-hmm. And so once I had it in my head, I was able, it was almost like a movie and I just typed it out and it literally took me 15 to 30 minutes. To just oh, you're it. kidding. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> wow. That's impressive. That's impressive. Uh, yeah. I work fast and surprisingly my poetry right now is really being popular and I'm really surprised by it because in my mind, it, it's just simple thoughts that are just flowing words I'm playing around with. That's just how my mind thinks. Do you, do you have your poetry published? Um, uh, yeah, and I actually, um, I submitted two poems to a magazine and it's, oh, um, other poetry can be found all over the in- internet, obviously. Anyone that Googles me, Diana Caprina, you'll get. Awesome. Very good. We'll include that down to the show notes, uh, to all of your socials. We'll talk about that in just a bit too. I got to ask you, were there any specific moments or scenes in the book that uh, you found challenging or emotional to write? No, because I, I had already gone through the process. Okay, so that was all behind you. Okay, I wasn't sure if you'd wind up having a... I went through the emotions, and when I say it's a process, I mean, I'm in my head, and I probably look absolutely like I'm not doing anything, or I might be walking around, but it's a continuously. It just wasn't... I, it, I stick in my head for so long because I try to feel it as much as I can. Uh, I feel as though if I feel my work, if I'm able to feel it internally, and I put it out, then... Others can feel it, can relate to it, um, do better with it, uh, get inspired by it, whatever. As a creative, I, I, um, I always want to be heard. I want to be read, um, even though I shy away from it. Like, I love it and I hate it at the same time. <laughs> Very good. Now, I understand we, we talked about it a little bit earlier. There is a follow-up book in the works. When can we expect it? And what can you tell us about this follow-up? Um, so that book is coming out, uh, in time for Halloween, uh, oh, geez. Okay, wonderful. Great. um, October 1st, we changed a few characters. So the unicorn will no longer be, um, and for me, I realized since this story really is not even about my daughter and she's already outgrown the unicorn phase. And since it's really about me and giving myself the voice that I never had as a child at nine, um, I brought in the cat. 
And I actually, surprisingly, while, while um, I was making the changes and were playing around with the words, uh -huh. uh, and through my research, I discovered that, um, I want to say, I, I don't want to mistake if it was Scotland or Irish um, belief that there's a cert, um and the cert is a cat that appears. And if you put out um, milk, milk, uh -huh. and the, before the Hallow's Eve, uh -huh. um, the, the surf will come and bless your house and drink the milk. Mm -hmm. And how cool is that? And I yeah. was like, oh, yeah. there's there's some path to this. I can really use this. I try to really make connections in my writing that really everyone can relate. So there's no, um, try to embrace all of diversity. Mm -hmm. Now, I said that we're heard all around the world in 85 countries. There's a lot of aspiring writers listening in today. What advice would you give them about your experience in writing the book and how they should learn from you as far as that goes from your experiences? What would you impart to them to say, hey, you know, if you if you want to be an aspiring writer, go for it. What would you say? Right, right. Fail. Fail a lot. Be ready to fail. Rip it up. Read it. Re-edit right 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 and just throw it out there and especially with the internet right now it the internet is an incredible place if you can utilize it uh for the mo for the creatives who really want to understand themselves brand themselves as, as a author writer mm -hmm. um take some classes in business because that is the most the only way you're going to be able to understand how you fit in how you can be heard how you can think outside of the box and really reach out to the publishers, how you can do that. And business is so helpful for the creatives, um, especially how it's being taught today. And I wouldn't be able to say that unless I was myself in business school. And that was the reason why I went, because I know how hard it is to send out your book and just completely always continuously be rejected. And you might be even incredibly talented, but if you don't have a following, if you are not, being seen or you don't have at least a thousand people following yeah. me on some social me media you mm -hmm. you're not you, nobody's they're not traditional publishers will not be interested yeah. so Understand. you no. need to grow grow fail fail learn be as authentic as possible that is the truest voice you have What's your thoughts on AI now, as far as like things with chat GPT, you could just go and put some ideas in and the next thing you know, you can kick out a, an entire manuscript. Uh, what are your thoughts on that to get past maybe some writer's block? Well, I mean, if you're struggling, why not get the help of AI? But the question is, it, it, you're going to read it. And if you say to yourself, well, this is the only, I can't edit this, or I can't do a rewrite from this, mm -hmm. but then you're just being... So, but that's how my mind works. Uh -huh. If I started using AI, I would be completely forgoing my creative process. So why would I do that to myself? Right, yeah. Can't do that to myself because I, I, my mind works like that. I've observed it. I've healed it. I've played with it. And that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and if I want for help that that's just, then I'm not a writer. I'm yeah, not, exactly. I'm not an artist. It's yeah. not, not for me. Uh, yeah, I, I was wondering about that because there's a lot of individuals who are using that and say, I wrote it. Well, you typed the words in there. You know, that's basically all you did do is you typed in the, I need uh, 15,000 words. <laughs> What's Wait that? For research, something to learn from because it can pull up all that research. Uh -huh. It simplifies your research and simplified research is amazing. Yeah, uh, Simplified yeah. research is Google. Wow. What a brilliant thing. Because again, I grew up with no internet. I remember going to libraries and taking out the books and doing the research. So with Google, I type it in, all my questions are answered. Yeah, it'll save you a whole lot of time. Now, a couple of minutes ago, you were talking about the mm -hmm. fact that you need a uh, thousand people to follow you on social medias and such like that to actually be considered by a publisher and such. Let's give the links to all your socials here. I'll include them down in the show notes. So if anyone's listening right now and doesn't have a pen handy, uh, they'll be down in the show notes. So what would be your, uh, your links to your socials? Well, I'm really easy. It's just my name, Diana Caprina. Um, so on Facebook, it's just Diana Caprina. I'm easy f to find. I actually did build my following. So I make myself very accessible because I'm at a point where 
I got the hang of this. I can help others. So whoever needs me, Google me or just type on Facebook, type in Diana Cabrina. I should pop up and I'm available to answer questions uh, about writing, which platforms I prefer to use as a creative. I actually just switched over to threads, just randomly found okay. it. Okay, there you go. All right. Um, my poetry just became just, whew, just, just a creative atmosphere on threads this has been remarkable. So yeah. to those who are writing on threads, keep doing it, mm -hmm. um, get inspired, create together and writing is such a lonely thing that it, it's really helpful to have other people um, writing alongside with you and sharing. Very good. Very good. Now here's something I, I've, I have to ask. Americans have kind of a preconceived notion of what life in Russia might have been as far as Mother Russia's cold and, and strict and you have you can do this, you only have enough money to buy this and such, and you're lucky enough to have enough eggs and such to, to make a meal. What's something about your former home that might surprise us? You mentioned a couple of things that the arts are funded by the state. What are yeah. some other what are some other things that might surprise well, us about now? Again, so when I when I give these reflections, this is to the Soviet Union. I can't speak for the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. I believe um it's a very much different really run now mm -hmm. um, as before, where the government sponsors these programs and makes ballet available for all and you can go see the Moscow if you're there, it was free or very low admission, I don't even remember, but it was available. It was available for all. Um, I think the most surprising would be that it was very creative because people really were forced to think outside of bo the box. And mm -hmm. I think everyone sees, the Amer Amer Americans see Russia from just that um, authoritarian, almost like they have guards and they do this, and nobody really sees it for how the people lived and how they were surviving mm -hmm. and what connected them and how they work together for the community that is so lost. I watched the Rocky movie. There was uh, when he was fighting. Oh yeah. Rocky, Rocky, Rocky four. I think is what it was. Yeah, Rocky four. <laughs> yeah. I love the Rocky movies. Um, and for me, it was really interesting to see how America portrayed Russia. Is so yeah. like, so cold and scary for me, they, they weren't, they were just people, people who were, uh, trying to survive and that's it because nobody really understands what it's like to be in a place where everyone's just trying to survive. Mm, I got it. Yeah. Um, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. and, and the only people that could actually relate to that would be uh, survivors. So trauma survivors, they can say, Oh, I understand that. Every, I understand that. But anyone that has a comfortable life, what does it mean to survive? Right. Yes. We're speaking with Diana Kuprina. She's got a book out right now called The Adventures of the Girl with Pink Hair. I highly recommend. Where's it available at, Diana? We forgot to mention that. Oh, yes. Uh, again, my Facebook, there's a link. It's um, also sold in Barnes & Noble. Okay. Uh, book. Uh, and again, I'm just waiting to see if it actually, there's more requests for it before I go into the actual book, the hardcover copy and all of that. Okay, very good. Very good. Thanks so much for being a guest on the podcast today, Diana. It, you're an absolute wonder. Uh, oh, we we, we really, enjoy, really enjoyed talking with you today. I wish you the very best for this book and the many books to follow. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. This, it was so much fun, too. John Records Landecker. On the DJ Hall of Fame, here on Rewound Radio. Hi, Rick Anthony here. I had a chance to interview some great folks on my Someone You Should Know podcast heard around the world. One of the most interesting folks I've spoken with has been John Records Landecker. Well, here's some good news. John will be featured on the Rewound Radio DJ Hall of Fame the last two weekends of March. You will hear unscoped recordings of John from Michigan, Philadelphia, Toronto, Cleveland, and of course, the Big 89, WLS, and other stations in Chicago. As part of the fun, we'll include some segments from my recent podcast with John just to give some additional context to the special. Don't miss it. John Records Landacre, March 23rd and March 30th from noon until 3 Eastern Time on Rewound Radio, where it's not how old it is, it's how good it is. Rewound Radio, DJ Hall of